My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs. A very warm welcome to this uh, IIA webinar on crimes against Armenian cultural heritage in Nagorno-Karabakh. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by two leading experts on this topic, Dr. Laurie Kachdorian and Dr. Derek Fincham. In a moment, our chair for today, Seamus Martin, is going to introduce our speakers. But before that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Seamus Martin. Seamus is someone who will be known to many people on the call. Seamus is a retired international editor and former Moscow correspondent at the Irish Times. In retirement, Seamus has worked as a long-term observer for the OSCE, including in both Armenia and Azerbaijan. Seamus is also a dedicated patron of the Institute of International European Affairs. And it was my surprise to learn this is the first time he's been invited to chair something. So it's a great honour, Seamus. And I hand over to you to take us through the uh, next hour or so. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome everyone uh, to this IAEA webinar. I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Derek Fincham, Professor at the South Texas College of Law in Houston, and Dr. Lori Khachadurian, Associate Professor of Near Eastern Studies and Anthropology at Cornell University. They've both been very generous to take time out of their schedules to speak to us. Our two experts will speak for about 10 minutes each uh, or so, uh, and then we'll go to Q&A with the audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please be free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them once Dr. Fincham and Dr. Khachaturian have finished their presentations. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We are also live streaming this morning's session. So a very well, a warm welcome to you all who are tuning in via YouTube. I now formally institute, introduce Dr. Fincham and hand over to him. Dr. Fincham is, professor of, is a professor at South, College, South Texas College of Law in Houston, where he teaches leisure research and writing and art law. Dr. Fincham serves on the editorial board of the International Journal of Cultural Property and, John, and runs the Illicit Cultural Property blog. Over to you, Dr. Fincham. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be, and thanks for the warm welcome and thank, thanks uh, for the invitation uh, to visit with, with, with everyone on this important topic uh, uh, today. So I'll, you know, do my best to keep uh, keep my remarks to about ten minutes or so, and um, um, hand it over to to my my uh, uh, my colleague who I've just met virtually here, Dr. Kachadurian, um, who's who's I think going to give us some more uh, detail on the specifics of this conflict. But I'm going to kind of give a little bit of context and and some international legal context for um, uh, looting, theft, and destruction of works of art, which sadly uh, during armed conflict have a very long history. Um, and so perhaps uh, many of y'all might be familiar with some of the history or, or, or parts of the world that have been uh, touched by armed conflict and the cultural heritage destruction, which uh, sadly goes hand in hand. Um, you know, Persian forces burned and sacked the Acropolis way back in 479 BCE. The Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem was destroyed uh, by the Assyrians in 586 BCE. Uh, later also uh, damaged by, by Roman forces. You know, these religious centers were destroyed and many of the sacred objects and the statuary and, 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 and pieces of that cultural heritage, those cultural heritage sites would have been removed as spoils of war. And so these sacred objects, these cultural objects, these works of art, they embody the past and they're integral to a people uh, and to their heritage. And that that cultural value, that heritage value, well exceeds any economic value uh, that likely might exist uh, for some of this material. Um, one of the uh, you know important uh, historical uh, events was the 
um, devastation at Constantinople uh, in 1204 during the, the Fourth Crusade, and, and palaces and churches and monasteries and libraries were plundered. And among the objects plundered were the four horses of St. Mark. They were also later taken by Napoleon, and today they're found uh, at the Museum of St. Mark's uh, in Venice. So these works of art uh, move around um, and, and are portable, uh, even though they're meant to kind of stay where they have their, uh, their piece of significance. And in the 16th century, uh, a, a name that will likely be familiar, the political philosopher uh, Niccolo Machiavelli advocated that a ruler should destroy a conquered city so that it doesn't retain its distinct cultural identity, its memory, and uh, therefore be a motivation uh, for future rebellion. Um, and that's uh, what we might call the old way of thinking about uh, armed conflict. As the international law of warfare with respect to cultural heritage has developed, particularly during the 19th century, the protection of heritage in other areas of the world during conquest and colonization, as this body of law was uh, coming, coming in into being, it was also consistently ignored uh, by, by European powers, by colonial powers, by imperial powers. And so whatever uh, norms for restitution of cultural objects uh, might, might be um, in, in development among European and, and North American nations, there's not really been a parallel recognition in international law at the time that the appropriation of cultural objects from quote unquote uncivilized or remote areas of the world was improper. And so examples of that, of course, include uh, the Zodiac figures, which were looted by the British and French forces from the Summer Palace in Beijing in 1860, which have circulated in private collections. And in addition, some of the figures have appeared on the market um, and, and legal uh, remedies have been, been difficult to come by. In the same way, bronze uh, objects and ivory objects taken from the Oba during the British Punitive Exhibition in 1897 in, in Benin, in what is modern day Nigeria, still uh, remain in museums and private collections in London and Paris and New York, and Chicago and elsewhere. And so the current state of the conflict uh, in, in this region, um, contested by, by Armenia and by Azerbaijan, um, can be tied to the void left after, I think, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the region is subject to competing claims and one of the things that we should keep in mind as we kind of uh, have our conversation is think about the current international legal regime, which does have a role to play in helping to secure and safeguard cultural heritage sites uh, in, in parts of the world uh, suffering on conflict. And the important uh, international legal treaty to, to think about this morning will be uh, the 1954 Hague Convention. So after the end of the Second World War, with its massive destruction, and in and large scale looting of cultural objects, the international community came together and created a legal um, treaty, a legal regime specifically to protect cultural heritage. And so this is the first international convention devoted exclusively to cultural heritage. It's formulated in 1954 uh, and both Armenia and Azerbaijan have acceded to the convention uh, since back in 1993. So it's worth thinking about what are the obligations of both of these uh, states. Uh, and so number one, the commitments made to a party to the Hague Convention serves to preserve cultural heritage through implementing several key steps before the advent of armed conflict. Number one, adopting preventive measures such as preparing inventories, planning for emergency measures to protect uh, and secure against the risk of fire or collapse of buildings, and to prepare to remove cultural objects to places of safety. Also to develop initiatives which guarantee respect for the cultural property situated in their own territory or in the territory of other states, uh, parties to the convention. So this involves refraining from using um, cultural sites in any manner that might expose it to destruction or deterioration in the event of armed conflict and by refraining from acts of hostility directed against culture and cultural heritage sites. In addition, uh, these states should register these cultural sites of very high importance on the International Register of Cultural Property under special protection in order to obtain uh, protection for these sites, make certain important buildings and monuments with a distinctive emblem of the convention, uh, the so-called Blue Shield Movement, um, provide a place for eventual refuge and shelter for uh, movable cultural objects, 
and even establish special units uh, within armed forces that are responsible for the protection of cultural objects. Um, also set sanctions for any breaches of the convention and promote the convention uh, as well to the general public. So these are the obligations that any state party to the 1954 Hague Convention uh, are obligated to, to abide by. Um, and one thing to think about, um, you know, when you, you know, whether it's uh, this part of the world or any part of the world suffering from, from armed conflict, um, there's been a change in thinking from the old, you know, Machiavellian way of thinking about, well, to the victor go the spoils. There's been a, a new a renewed emphasis within um, uh, militaries, within the UNESCO framework, within the, you know, the Hague Convention framework. To think about cultural sites and cultural objects as not just, um, uh, you know, things that can be used uh, by the victor, but rather um, important aspects uh, of a rights-based regime. These are cultural objects uh, that are essential uh, for any people, for any culture, um, uh, to move on after the conflict. And so, um, whatever a, a, a given military objective is, whatever uh, those armed forces, whatever their um, their ultimate goal might be, protecting and preserving cultural objects um, should be seen, in my view, uh, as part of the mission. As um, you know, wherever you're at, there's going to be a, an after of the armed conflict, and and those people will need their their culture. They'll need their uh, their 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 important sites, and the destruction. Um, and, and other uh, serious crimes against these objects and sites that we're going to hear about, uh, I think, from our next speaker, uh, are really an important thing to uh, to pay attention to. And so I really welcome this conversation uh, in, in thinking about these issues uh, in this part of the world. Um, so that's just a little bit. That's a very broad overview and a background. I hopefully have st stuck to my 10 minutes or so. So I will, uh, if I could, uh, maybe hand it back uh, uh, back back to the moderators and, and hand it over to, to the next speaker. Thank you very much indeed. Very uh, interesting and erudite contribution from Dr. Fincham. Uh, and I'd now like to hand over to and to introduce formally uh, Dr. Khacha Durian. Uh, Laurie Khacha Durian is Associate Professor of Near Eastern Studies and anthropology at Cornell University, and co-founder and co-director of Caucasus Heritage Watch. Her research uses the methods of archaeology and anthropology to study heritage politics and the ruins of modernity, with a particular focus on the South Caucasus. Over to you, Dr. Khadjadurian. Thank you. So much, Seamus, for that introduction, uh, Dr. Fincham. Thank you, thank you for your thoughtful remarks. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation to participate in this important panel. I'm going to uh, share my slides. So, in late 2020, amidst war and ethnic cleansing and a humanitarian catastrophe in Nagorno-Karabakh, my colleagues and I formed this research group called Caucasus Heritage Watch, or CHW which uses high resolution satellite imagery to document cultural heritage caught in the crosshairs of this intractable conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. CHW is a program in what we have come to call heritage forensics, an approach to cultural remains that operates at the intersection of archeology, span law, politics, and cultural aerospace. The imperative for heritage researchers to engage in forensic research is more pressing today than ever, as multinational agencies like UNESCO retreat from accountability work, and as courts like the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Court, and the International Court of Justice have begun to adjudicate on the intentional destruction of cultural heritage. The wars in Nagorno-Karabakh in 2020 and 2023 have raised grave concerns about the fate of the region's cultural heritage. These concerns rest on a decades long history of cultural heritage abuse by all parties to the conflict. Understanding this history is essential to grasping the current situation, the nature of the threats posed to cultural heritage today and why heritage forensics is needed. 
So my remarks today uh, will, are organized into two parts. First, I will discuss the treatment of Armenian cultural heritage in Nakhchivan, an exclave of Azerbaijan located here to the west, southwest of uh, Armenia. Uh, after the ceasefire to the first Nagorno-Karabakh War in 1994. Then I'll turn to our satellite monitoring program and the impacts we have documented to Armenian heritage since the 2020 war. In the interest of time, in this presentation, I will not discuss another very important forensic investigation that my colleagues and I conducted into the treatment of Azerbaijani cultural heritage in Nagorno-Karabakh, during the 30 years of de facto Armenian control, but I would be happy to discuss those findings a bit in the Q&A if there's interest. Our first major investigation, excuse me, slide, that was just indicating where Nakhichevan is. Our first major investigation sought to provide forensic evidence in support of reports that Azerbaijan had conducted a systematic program of cultural erasure in Azerbaijan's Nakhchivan Autonomous Republic beginning in 1997. In a rare case of integrating Cold War spatial sources from both sides of the Iron Curtain, we used Soviet topographic maps like the one you see on the top left and declassified American satellite imagery, precisely the Hexagon uh, Reconnaissance Mission, which was declassified by Barack Obama in 2011. We used these sources to precisely geolocate and assess the condition of 110 Armenian cultural heritage sites in this region of Nakhchivan. Our investigation found that 108 of the 110 sites had been expunged from the landscape. The goal of the destruction in Nakhchivan was not simply ruination, but complete obliteration. Sites like this one, the Mesrop Mashtots Monastery of Mesropavan, which you see here, on this is one of the hexagon American uh, satellite images, uh, which had stood since before the 15th century, was not just knocked over, they were completely scrubbed from the landscape, as you can see in this 2006 satellite image. The 7th century Karmir Monastery of Astapat uh, was also completely denuded. Every block of this complex, complex hauled away after centuries of preservation. So you see a photograph in the center, the hexagon satellite image on the left from 1973, and a 2003 satellite image with the structure no longer there. In most cases, the land on which Armenian monuments once stood remained a vacant plot well into our current decade. But in five cases, new monuments were erected directly atop the foundations of the former Armenian site. So this is a kind of uh, a symbolic appropriation that followed on the physical violence of demolition. Let me give you a couple examples of that. This is the monastery of St. Tovma seen in a 1973 hexagon satellite image. An Iconos satellite image from 2000 shows that St. Tovma had been recently destroyed with only segments of the enclosure wall remaining. The arrow is pointing to this. But a subsequent quick bird two image from 2009 shows the monastery's complete destruction. Only a rectangular plot amidst the trees reveals the place where the building had stood since the 14th century. And in this 2000 satellite image, we see a new mosque built atop St. Tofma's ruination. Nowhere is the bombast of replacement more cynically visible than at the former new Armenian cemetery of Nakhchivan city. The cemetery set atop a tall hill once included over 1000 tombstones dating from the 18th to the 20th centuries. The site was marked on Soviet topographic maps and visible in hexagon imagery from 1973 at left. By February 2000, in the center, the cemetery had been erased, and years later, in 2014, atop the scattered bones of the erased Armenians opened the Museum of the National Flag, which you see at right, a blaring terraced monument reached by a grand stairway, atop which waves an enormous Azerbaijani flag. A second distinctive feature of the cultural erasure in Nakhchivan was its surgical precision and totality. With ruthless efficiency, virtually the entire inventory of Armenian heritage was targeted, demolished, and expunged. Indeed, the program was pursued with such bureaucratic rigor that in several instances, bulldozers were deployed into already abandoned and remote mountain villages to take out the ruins of an Armenian church. For instance, here, the village of Mijin Ankuzik was already in ruins in 1973. You can see the ruins of the buildings on the hexagon satellite image. 
But by November 2009, the remains of the village's Armenian church was targeted and erased. And there are other such examples of this, where in already abandoned villages with you know, decaying ruins, only the ruins of the church are surgically taken out. Such attention, to, uh, such attention to excising even the most obscure vestiges of Armenian inhabitation indicates that erasure was not a spontaneous or distributed project. Only organs of the state would have known the sites as Armenian and been able to project destruction into the remote mountains. Our silent erasure web platform provides a site-by-site -site inventory, each with its own story map, for all 108 sites eradicated between 1997 and at the very latest 2011. Such coordination ensured not only the program's totality, but also secured its most distinctive feature, silence. Since the first reports of the destruction at the medieval Armenian cemetery of Jura, Azerbaijani state officials have stonewalled, blocking access to the now destroyed sites, including blocking the US ambassador, blocking a European parliament mission as well. They have also denied the destruction. And with the evidence erased, Azerbaijani officials have promulgated a new historical orthodoxy that Armenians never lived in Nakhchivan. Uh, global precedents for such total and secretive erasure are few, and I'm happy to talk about this, this case in comparative context in the Q&A, again, if there's interest. Let's turn to the second uh, focus here in our satellite monitoring work. CHW's primary activity has been monitoring new attacks on cultural heritage following the second Nagorno-Karabakh war in 2020 and creating evidence that can hold perpetrators accountable. In the aftermath of the erasure in Nakhchivan and the ceding of territories to Azerbaijan, it was very clear to observers that Armenian churches and monasteries and historic cemeteries within these transferred territories were at risk, threatened by the same policy of zero tolerance for Armenian historic remains that we've just seen in Nakhchivan. Since 2021, we have conducted a sustained program of monitoring, tasking planets SkySat constellations to provide us with satellite imagery twice a year to maintain regular surveillance of at-risk sites. Just last month, we released our seventh monitoring report, which you can access from our website. Excuse me, I'm just advancing a bit too, too far here. Until Azerbaijan's military capture of Nagorno-Karabakh in September, 2023, we were monitoring roughly 280 medieval and early modern sites, which you see in the purple rectangles on this map. But that number has since risen to about 450 sites after the final expulsion of Armenian residents in Nagorno-Karabakh last fall. So this map reflects uh, our current monitoring database. To date, CHW has documented 14 confirmed destroyed sites in Nagorno-Karabakh, 12 damaged and 31 threatened since the second Nagorno-Karabakh war. This map shows the geographic distribution of impacts which are concentrated in the area of the Fizuli Shusha Highway. If you can see my cursor, that's along here, the site of Shushi itself, which you can see in this inset, um, and the Kelbajar Lachin corridor. You see this road being built here, and in this area in Kelbajar and Lachin, uh, we have seen several impacts. So let me offer a few general observations based on our findings to date uh, about the patterns we're seeing so far. First, the targeting of historic cemeteries in particular is an emerging feature of heritage destruction in Karabakh, one that harkens to the 40 bulldozed cemeteries that we documented in Nakhchivan. And I should note, with respect to Dr. Pincham's remarks, that Armenian cemeteries are not listed in the Azerbaijani heritage inventories, so they're not protected by the bureaucracy of listing, uh, so, which even still has protected other monuments, but in any case, uh, cemeteries are not listed. Thus far, we have identified destroyed burial grounds in the villages of Medz Tagher and Sughnach and Shusha and Aknach Bur. And an additional five cemeteries have been, see, uh, have been uh, damaged or uh, partially bulldozed. Um, and the bulldozing of cemeteries, of course, serves to erase the stone testimonials to Armenian belonging in this troubled land. Second, churches are officially designated as Caucasian Albanian, which is an enigmatic group that Azerbaijani historians and official state doctrine claim incorrectly as the primordial forebearers of the Azerbaijani nation, are not necessarily safe from demolition. 
In summer 2022, we documented the destruction of the 18th or 19th century uh, St. Sarkis Church in the village of Mokrenes. This is an Armenian church, which is listed on the uh, on Azerbaijan's monument list as a Caucasian Albanian temple, uh, but was, uh, was, was destroyed, as you can see here in the 2022 satellite image. While the more well-known and architecturally impressive churches and monasteries um, uh, you know, may, may, may be preserved for some time. Small village churches are at risk, even if they are included on the state lists and thus purportedly subject to protection under Azerbaijan's law and culture. Third observation, even as regional experts closely follow a case before the International Court of Justice, which may offer a new precedent for cultural heritage protection, we must also pay attention to how, how Azerbaijan's domestic cultural property laws work to render the destruction of Armenian monuments legal. In the ongoing case, Armenia versus Azerbaijan, Armenia has argued that the deliberate targeting of Armenian heritage sites, along with other abuses, plausibly constitutes a violation of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, or the CERD. And as far as I know, this is the first time that the CERD has been invoked in international law as a, uh, as a tool for uh, redressing cultural heritage abuse. Armenia has submitted our, uh, excuse me, uh, yes, Armenia has submitted our reports, CHW's findings as evidence in this case. Recognizing the threat of irreparable harm, in December 2021, the ICJ issued a provisional ruling ordering Azerbaijan to prevent and punish abuses of Armenian cultural heritage. This is the first legal finding to draw a connection between racial discrimination and cultural heritage destruction. And for this reason, it is significant or may be significant, but it remains to be seen how the court will respond to the many violations of its ruling that CHW has already documented since the, since the ruling in, into 2021. And there is reason to doubt that the ICJ can become an effective force for heritage preservation. At the same time, provisions in Azerbaijani laws vest tremendous authority in executive bodies to determine the significance and value of cultural resources, and thus the degree of state protection that they enjoy. The destruction of St. John the Baptist Church in Shusha just a few months ago, uh, or that we reported just a few months ago, but likely occurred earlier this year, uh, was likely authorized through loopholes in these laws. Finally, our monitoring to date shows that the logics of heritage abuse in Nagorno-Karabakh are complex and entangled. The proximal causes of impacts are massive infrastructure and redevelopment projects, including highways, power plants, airports, and housing development. Consider the example of the Meds Tahrir Cemetery. In its final form, the new road barely impinged on the territory of the former cemetery. Here, the destruction was thus not a sacrifice to the needs of development, but rather a collateral benefit, a chance for development to not only create a new future, but to silence the past. Elsewhere, for instance, in Shusha, where the entire city is undergoing redesign, it is more difficult to pin the motivation for destruction exclusively on a desire to eliminate the perceived threat posed by the material vestiges of Armenian cultural life. This also means that along with causality, questions of culpability and ethics become more complicated as the actors involved are not only Azerbaijani authorities, but also international master planners like the British firm Chapman Taylor, which secured the contract for Shusha's redesign and construction firms from Hungary, Turkey and elsewhere that profit from terraforming Karabakh's landscape. Heritage forensics entails more than simply using satellites to detect abuses to heritage, but pursuing the legal, ethical, political, and indeed economic implications of these findings. So my team and I will continue this work in the years ahead. I very much appreciate your attention and look forward to the discussion. Thank you.